please let me know if you're being able to see it. Okay, for sure. Can I pause here? Okay, so once again, it's a real honor to have the opportunity to share some time with you. I do want to um, make sure that the signal is good enough and that you're being able to hear me well. So please stop me if there are questions or if you cannot hear me. Okay, I got it. You got it. Keep going. So the order of the day, I wanted to briefly make an introduction to minimally invasive surgery in pediatric urology. The current state of the minimally invasive approaches that are currently done on pediatric urology, my own perspective about the future of minimally invasive surgery, and then maybe just uh, show and share with you a few patients that I've done where I believe um, I can just share a little bit of the technical aspects and, and maybe give you a little, a few tips that I've learned along the way. Uh, and I'll try to focus mostly on pyeloplasties, ureteral reimplantation, reconstructive urology, which is one of my favorite topics in minimally invasive surgery. And then a few other approaches that I believe are a little novel for the um, management of patients in pediatric urology. So just so you uh, get a little sense of uh, where I'm practicing right now, uh, I'm currently uh, an attending at the Seattle Children's Hospital that it's uh, affiliated to the University of Washington. This is a referral center for what we call the WAMI region. And the WAMI region is, uh, it's constituted by the Washington State, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. And this region covers about 25% of the entire US territory. So we do have a huge uh, catch up area uh, of referrals that we are the primary center that care for these patients. Uh, we are a total of eight pediatric urologists and the hospital you can see below, um, it's uh, four, 407 uh, beds uh, for only pediatric patients and we have uh, 153 surgical beds um, and a total of 7,600 surgeries were performed in 2020. This is with all the restrictions that we've had due to the pandemic and also uh, due to a problem that we have with a yeast that was uh, located at one of our ORs. So we're a very busy center and um, it's, uh, as I said, affiliated to the University of Washington. The Department of uh, Urology was founded in 1961. Um, luckily, it's one of the top 10 programs in the US. There is a total of 37 faculty members. And of those, as I said, eight are uh, pediatric urologists. There are seven research faculty dedicated uh, to the department. And we uh, you have between 19 and 20 residents um, in our program with a total of seven fellows. A little bit about myself. I was born in Colombia at the capital, Bogota, and I went to medical school and did also my training in urology at the Universidad Javeriana. And then I moved to the US and I trained at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Also did a PhD in genetics and then uh, found the light uh, at the end of the tunnel and went to live to Canada, uh, where I did a pediatric urology fellowship, um, as well as a postdoc at SickKids. And uh, I've been uh, an assistant professor at the University of Washington since last July, when I joined uh, Seattle Children's. I have to say that I'm very excited. Uh, this is the first time that I'm giving a talk in the future. Uh, today, it's Thursday and I'm located in Seattle, Washington. And you guys are um, virtually almost 12 hours ahead. Um, and so this is the first time, as I said, I'm giving a talk in the future. I wanna start by saying that um, every evidence that we have so far about minimally invasive surgery in pediatric urology is based on case series, uh, case reports, very few uh, well systematic um, 
reviews and uh, very few meta-analysis, but virtually no uh, randomized controlled trials. So the evolution of this discipline has been a lot different from what we're used to see in other areas of medicine. And I wanna be a little bit critical about this because this is actually the reason why I believe pediatric urology is so unique uh, compared to other uh, disciplines. So th that publication, um, I wrote it uh, recently and we actually looked at all the manuscripts that had been published in the literature about minimally invasive surgery. And we wanted to see how was the pickup uh, or how did the publications trended up over time and compared robot assisted manuscripts versus laparoscopic manuscripts. And we were able to see uh, a difference of roughly 200 manuscripts in, in, that, in the time frame that we looked at. But interestingly, uh, most of the publications were actually case series, as I said, uh, very few reviews, case reports, uh, very few animal models and only one experiment for robotic surgery and only one for inanimate models. And I wanna highlight this because I'll, I'll be talking about that uh, in the next few slides. Um, with regards to laparoscopy, there was uh, only two meta-analysis, um, but otherwise also very few inanimate models and uh, very few animal models. And I think that is actually showing up on this slide. Uh, we compared uh, how was the amount of publications over time for urological laparoscopy, urological robot assisted surgeries, pediatric surgery and otolaryngology uh, publications. And this was just to see how the productivity behaved over time. And you can see that the initial publications in 1989 and 1990s were just a few publications that were very randomly uh, published with low amounts per year. But then close to the 2000s, you can start seeing here that it starts trending up. So in the last 20 years, we've seen a continuous trend um, with more publications per year. But interestingly, the last, since 2018, the amount of robot assisted publications changed. And we started seeing more publications about this technology compared to urological laparoscopy and actually pediatric surgery in general with robotic surgery also trend up. So I think we're just looking at how interesting this topic is and how some authors continue to publish, but we've never reached the maximum amount of publications that was seen in 2016. And I think this is just a reflection of the times that takes publications to be published. These two slides are actually an impact index that I develop. It's a very simple mathematical formula that looks at the citation counts, but it adjusts the citation counts based on the time the publication has been uh, online or available. And you can see the impact index for robot assisted manuscripts has an average of um, between 60 to 80 um, points, meaning that the, the lower the index, the more impact it will have on the literature. And you can see that the uh, blue line that it's trending down, it's actually going down only because we only use or uh, interpret very recent publications. And we tend to forget about the older ones. But then when we look at the 2004, 2006 manuscripts, there are a lot with low Set, well, low impact index. That means that the lower the impact index, the more impact it has on the literature interpretation, meaning those are very important publications. And something not the, the same is seen on laparoscopic surgery. You can see that the trending is the same. We are just using more recent literature, but it's spread more diffusely 
uh, on the plot. And that means that we're not using as much literature from laparoscopic surgery than from robot assisted manuscripts. So I guess in general, uh, minimal invasive surgery in pediatric urology has focused their interest in extrapolating the experience of open surgery. In other words, what we have tried is to show that we can do the same procedures that we do open. And I think in a way, that's a mistake. If we're introducing a novel technology, yes, we have to show that it's equivalent to the open surgery, but we have to go beyond that. And I will try to show you a few things where I believe we can change our perspective about um, minimally invasive surgery as an innov innovative technology. Most of the urologists in the US and uh, other parts of the world um, get their training in adult surgery first and then do their training in pediatric um, fellowships. And I think that in a way tends to bias the way we perform our procedures because we have um, just applied our knowledge from adult surgery into pediatrics. And I think we definitely have to change a little bit the perspectives there, uh, mostly because if we don't do that, we will continue to do the same mistakes. And for example, we continue to use adult instruments for pediatric surgery. And the time I had um, in South America where I practiced uh, for almost four years, I actually had very limited resources and I had to just simply adjust to what was available and I uh, did a lot of uh, minimal invasive surgery with adult instruments. And that is definitely not ideal for our pediatric population. But we know for sure that it has been proven, the literature has proven so far that uh, minimal invasive surgery, it's efficient, equivalent, and safe. And I guess the future of minimal invasive surgery can, uh, can happen if we start thinking differently. This is an experiment that I did using the Da Vinci SI platform. And uh, on the upper image, you can see a pig. And so this was an animal um, experiment. We were simulating um, ureteral re-implant with the robot, but we actually were trying to reduce the distance between the ports which is something that the Da Vinci intuitive platform um, just recommends to have a distance of eight centimeters between ports. And in pediatric uh, abdomens, that's virtually impossible. So we did some experiments where we reduced the distance between ports and we looked at the area that the uh, robot could uh, cover and be efficient intra-abdominally, just simulating small uh, abdominal cavities that the ones that we have uh, in pediatric patients. And we actually found on this slide that the gray area, it's an area where the robot will not be uh, able to perform any movements. And the area of interest, which is the orange one, is where we could actually perform all the tasks that we needed. Um, and so I think planning for the ports with shorter distances in robotic surgery, it's feasible. And that will enable us to perform very fine surgery in pediatric patients. Since we wanted to be um, more ethical, we actually develop an inanimate model to further explore uh, the ability to perform multi-quadrant surgery. And since our interest in uh, here in Seattle is to perform complex reconstructive surgery, with multi-quadrant approach. Um, I think this experiment allowed us to better plan for working in small spaces um, and in different quadrants of the abdomen. So our experience in robotic surgery and minimally invasive surgery has uh, proven that we can do complex reconstructions. Uh, I'm glad to share this publication from my colleague, Jennifer Ann, um, Jonathan Ellison, and Thomas Landvey, who uh, used buccal graft to reconstruct ureters that were structured. And so this um, just starts uh, showing 
how we can go beyond the uh, experience of open surgery. This is another experiment. Yes. Yes, have I what? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just asking the Mongolian neurologist, have you ever experienced with the buckle craft? Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Um, and so, as I was saying, I think we have to push the limits. And this is actually another model an inanimate model where we used in utero surgery with the robot. And we were actually collaborating with neurosurgery and we were simulating spina bifida repairs intraoperatively with the robot going through the ureters on, on the mother. And the same was uh, performed for uh, bladder um, obstructions like uh, urethral valves uh, where we used to do vesicostomies in utero. So these simulations are actually really moving the, the line and, and just um, allowing us to perform uh, surgeries that had not been even considered uh, with open surgery. So I guess at this point, what I want to share with you is a few tricks and tips about uh, minimally invasive surgery. And one of the things that interestingly uh, enough, I, I found is that we as surgeons don't think much about cosmesis in pediatric patients. And I think it's because we're not at a moment where patients will verbalize and say, I don't want to have a scar. And I think that's very, very important. And we should be planning to uh, the moment when we're doing the surgery to just at least give a try to improve cosmesis of our port access. It may increase the challenging uh, techniques uh, and, and, and it will make the surgery a, a little bit more difficult. But here you can see that um, this was a kid who had an undescended testicle and I performed a fuller Stevens orchiopexy. I did go through the belly button and I actually have um, a, a way of doing it where I try to hide the incision at the base of the belly button. And you can see that it healed very well and also you can see on the left lower fossa, right below the line where the underwear is, uh, that's where I place the other port. And I think this uh, will be buried, but it will also facilitate uh, the benefit of doing minimally invasive surgery. If you do uh, minimally invasive surgery, I think it it's very important to be systematic uh, I think you can easily get in trouble if you don't do things exactly the same um, every time you can. So attention to details is very important. And also try to make it safe. I think um, at least the port access, I do it every time the same way. I'm happy to share with you um, the, a video about how I do it. Um, and I think that has uh, at least uh, keep, take, keeping me uh, safe uh, from any, any issues. Um, and also when you're doing complex and long surgeries, I think uh, it's really important to think about ergonomics and port placement, it's critical. This is one of my residents and I had to take a picture of him just struggling uh, to close the port because um, you can see clearly how you can struggle. And if you're, if you're not in a, in a comfortable position, then it's easy uh, for you to start making mistakes during the case. So positioning and port placement. I, I think um, for laparoscopic surgery, one of the most important things is um, the triangulation. I think um, 
I, I was always told to uh, avoid as much as I could placing additional trocars. Um, but I think if you're struggling, an additional trocar will never be uh, unnecessary. I think the more comfortable you can be, it's, it's, it's critical. Securing the patient and allowing tilting and moving of the table uh, throughout the procedure sometimes can make a huge difference. And I think having enough space uh, between the patient and the edge of the table is critical because sometimes you end up creating acute angles to uh, visualize the anatomy better. The novel um, robots are actually better at facilitating the port placement. And I don't think we have to think too much about how we place them, but uh, definitely it's, it's a critical component. And also, depending on the surgery that you will be doing, if you want to do multi-quadrant surgery, the more away you are from the uh, area of interest, the more easy it will be to perform multi-quadrant surgery. And I'll explain you a little bit about that in a few minutes. So for laparoscopy, I've seen that as soon as I started doing more robotic surgery and less laparoscopic surgery, for some reason, the patients were actually presenting less pain. And I think having the robot made me think where the pain comes from. And I think it's actually the abdominal wall. I don't think we have explored that in, uh, in detail and future studies should focus on that. But I've been uh, more aggressive about performing tap blocks of the abdominal cavity and quadratus lumborum uh, blocks at the end of the case um, in order to uh, facilitate good postoperative recovery. And I think it's because the robot does not put tension on the abdominal wall as we do with laparoscopic surgery. There is a phenomenon called burping. And this actually is uh, just is something that can only be done with a robot. And it's actually lifting up the abdomen uh, and that increases the visibility um, and uh, allows to reduce the pressure on the um, abdominal cavity uh, and the CO2. So for robotic surgery, if you uh, have the ability to uh, have one of the new robots, you can actually do change the way you place the trochers for laparoscopic surgery. This is actually a port placement that we use for pyeloplasties and it's called the hidden incision endoscopic surgery technique. Basically, this is a patient that it's laying on the right side, left side up, and the umbilical port is placed uh, to introduce uh, the camera, but you can also use all these three trochers at the fan and still line and bring the instruments all the way up into the area where you want to do the nephrectomy, pyeloplasty, or, or, or renal surgery. And that can only be done due to the ability of the robot and the joints that can move inside. Laparoscopic surgery might be a little bit more challenging. So there are two main platforms available right now, the SI and the XI. The SI is probably the previous um, platform. I'm lucky to say that I've been using the XI and it definitely facilitates more complex surgery. So in order to just uh, discuss a little bit about the uh, ureteral reimplantation, I think we all have seen the evolution of reflux over time and it's interesting how we have adjusted the way we treat reflux based on the technologies that we have available. If you review the literature, you can say that um, in 1940s, uh, once the BCUGs, the cystograms were um, started to be to uh, reconstruct all those patients with reflux. And then over time, we started 
hearing about the endoscopic management and everybody transitioned to endoscopic management, we then moved away uh, and started just observing these patients. And more recently with the robot, we are now about the uh, visibility and safety of robotic ureteral reimplantation. And this publication is from the group that has been very critical about the um, use of robotic surgery and ureteral reimplantation. Um, now the, the benefit of ureteral reimplantation is seen uh, thanks to the learning curve uh, that has stabilized. And uh, we've been able to now confirm that our results are very equivalent to open surgery. So uh, a few things that I believe are very helpful, and this applies not only for robotic surgery, but also for laparoscopic surgery. I think finding the ureter uh, just uh, at the level where it crosses the uh, iliac vessels is very, very important. Uh, if you try to find it more distal, uh, close to the, to the bladder, you may encounter a lot of vessels and that will make the dissection a little bit more challenging. So I think finding the ureter and then navigating distal into the bladder is, is gonna be very important. The tunnel creation, you can see on the second slide, you can see how uh, energy and uh, magnification actually allows a good dissection of the, of the uh, detrusor muscle. Um, there has been uh, significant concerns about urinary retention after uh, ureteral reimplantations. But uh, I've never had uh, that uh, situation with um, our patients here. And, and I think it's using low energy and making sure that the patient does not have voiding dysfunction um, before surgery. Um, you can see on these other slides uh, above and, and below how important it is to really estimate a good length of the, of the tunnel. And, and the reason for that is I think with the magnification that we have in laparoscopic surgery and more with robotic surgery, we do end up making shorter tunnels than the ones we would do open. And I think that was the initial reason for failure um, in, in the first few case series. Um, this is a surgery that lately with the pandemic, I actually have done a few as ambulatory outpatients. And the reason is to avoid um, just increasing the burden on the hospital beds, but also allow the patients to be treated. So we have done a few adjustments on how we're treating kids during the pandemic to um, allow and, and facilitate and reduce the long-term issues that our patients can have. So selecting the patient is very important for uh, ureteral reimplantation. I tend to not do surgery until I have uh, treated the voiding dysfunction and the constipation thoroughly. And the reason is, I believe that if patients continue to have voiding dysfunction and constipation, they will easily get in trouble after surgery and surgery may fail. So I, I would suggest not performing any surgeries before completing uh, a good course of um, biofeedback training and making sure that the, the families are committed. Also, it's really important to understand the expectations. Uh, I think it's, it's important to know that a radiographic improvement of the reflux is something completely different from clinical success. And I tend to base my uh, success on uh, clinical aspects. And if patients are not having febrile urinary tract infections, I never do any radiographic studies after surgery. So monitoring, I think it should be done clinically more than radiologically. I'm actually moving away from ionizing studies and I stopped doing VCUGs or uh, um, cystograms with uh, radiographic contrast. And I'm using now more ultrasound uh, cystograms with uh, contrast. For pyeloplasties, I think this is a very um, important technique that we use to show how robotic and laparoscopic surgery has proven to be equivalent and efficient. 
Um, and I think the techniques that we use for open surgery are exactly the same for laparoscopic and robotic surgery. And I have actually, um, and, and I, I can say that I'm lucky enough to have had uh, a very extensive training in open surgery, but also have the uh, chance of um, combining that to minimally invasive surgery and laparoscopic surgery, which is something that uh, interestingly is not as common uh, now in the US, uh, mostly because training uh, nowadays bases uh, most of uh, his training in um, minimally invasive surgery and, and robotic surgery. So uh, residents are actually not exposed as much to open surgery. Um, and so I've been pushing more uh, to do minimally invasive surgery, even on babies with a few months old, um, mostly because I can see the anatomy better. And I'm always worried that even if it's an intrinsic UPJ obstruction, that I may miss a crossing vessel. And that's something that can easily happen with open surgery. With laparoscopic surgery, you can visualize the entire anatomy without any issues. Um, and another um, thing that I've been changing recently about my management is I've been trying to do earlier surgery. Even if I'm not 100% uh, sure that the patient is losing function on the nuclear scans, that the uh, hydronephrosis is not worsening, but I see partial obstruction with somehow mild to moderate, uh, I'm sorry, moderate to severe hydronephrosis, I do tend to act sooner. I don't wait to see loss of function, worsening of the hydronephrosis. And that's actually due to results from um, recent publications. I think the one you're seeing here from the New England Journal, it's a publication uh, from Israel that shows that patients with even healthy kidneys, but mild hydronephrosis end up having early onset of end-stage kidney disease at the early adulthood uh, years. So I think we have to be more uh, aggressive and cognizant about the implications long-term uh, from our patients. A little bit uh, about the cases that I've done. Uh, this is a very interesting case that I recently met. He is a 19 year old male with autism and a non neurogenic bladder um, that um, was presenting to me after having a multi channel creation to, in, to perform intermittent catheterizations. The family was really worried because the patient was having um, incontinence, and th this was putting a lot of burden on the family, um, and he was not being able to be um, very independent. So the offer was to revise the Monty channel, and usually when we do it open, we uh, just go through the channel and then dissect the abdominal wall off the channel and then go uh, all the way down into the bladder. With this robotic approach, I, this is the first time that I can say that I was able to see the anatomy completely different and better than what I could have done with open surgery. And what I did was um, on the first uh, image on the left, you can see the balloon inside the bladder with the pedicle to the channel feeding the channel. So it was really important to be very careful about not injuring the vasculature. And then I was able to uh, clearly dissect the channel of the bladder and then create a submucosal tunnel and pretty much re-implant that ileal conduit that we had created. You can see on the third image on the right, uh, the light of the cystoscope going into the channel. And that allowed me to find the junction between the Monty channel and the bladder. And at that point, I perform a Nissen um, same technique that it's used for uh, reflux on, on the stomach and the esophagus, I did almost a, a, fun, a nissen fund application of the bladder around the channel. And luckily, the patient is now continent and being able to catheterize without any complications. So here you can see how I wrapped the bladder around the channel and anchored that to the uh, abdominal wall. And so that facilitated the continents. This is another uh, interesting case of reconstructive pediatric urology. This was a girl who presented uh, at age eight 
with a non-functioning upper moiety with massive distension of the ureter and recurrent urinary tract infections. I discussed with the family all the possible options, um, including a ureter, ureterostomy, ureterm, uh, the most uh, aggressive management in order to reduce any future complications. And so um, our biggest concern was that the severe dilation was actually displacing the hilum and it was gonna be very challenging to really dissect that off during surgery. And so we used a robot to uh, identify the anatomy better, perform the surgery with minimal invasive um, approach, but also we used intraoperative ultrasonography, and we were able to identify the anatomy better. You can see on the slide on the left that I was placing the probe right where the healthy kidney was, but just a few millimeters uh, uh, more medial, you can see how I changed the position. And now I was on top of the dilated ureter. So I think this is something that definitely reduces the morbidity on a very complex surgery and the patient actually went home the next day after completing the complete uh, heminephrectomy. So what I did was I localized uh, on the image on the left, I localized the ureter, opened it up and was able to dissect all the way up and remove the non-functioning uh, upper moiety without injuring the uh, lower moiety. And you can see here on the lower, uh, on the image on the middle, uh, how good vasculature was preserved with that careful dissection. And at the end, we just simply um, marsupialized the upper um, edges of the uh, upper collecting system and the patient, as I said, recovered really well. Um, a similar case was the one of a 12 year old uh, girl with recurrent infections and a complex cystic mass. Um, it was actually difficult to identify grossly uh, with the laparoscopic approach. So we used the ultrasound to define the location of the cyst and perform a partial nephrectomy that was guided with ultrasonography. Um, this is um, a four-year-old, I'm sorry, a seven-year-old boy who was presenting with intermittent episodes of pain. Um, he had a few ultrasounds with no dilation, but during one of the episodes of a diddle crisis, he actually had severe and massive dilation. And so we thought that uh, it was gonna be a crossing vessel um, that was causing the, the issue. Um, and uh, at that point, um, what we end up doing during the procedure was uh, we found that there was a complete malrotation of the kidney not previously seen on, uh, on preoperative images. And we end up seeing that um, the, the ureter was right behind the kidney. We had to rotate it. Um, I decided to perform a Foley uh, type pyeloplasty um, in order to um, open up the, the ureter and look for possible intraluminal polyps. Um, and so at the end, we uh, perform an angiopexy. You can see on the image here below that um, the kidney had to be lifted in order to reduce the compression. And so far the patient continues to be asymptomatic. Um, uh, can, I'm sorry, uh, can, um, case number five. Um, so the uh, obstructive mega ureter, I think it's a condition that it's also very challenging to manage. Um, and it's sometimes um, multiple uh, offer uh, options can, can be provided to the families. But I think this six-year-old boy who, has, who was presenting with intermittent episodes of pain um, and hydroureter nephrosis um, was uh, having a lot of issues. And so we discussed with the family a possible ureteral reimplantation, uh, ureteral vesicostomy, or uh, nephrectomy. And uh, the family elected to <clears throat> try to preserve the uh, kidney despite just having 15% uh, function on the nuclear scan. And so what we did was we found the ureter on uh, the level of the crossing vessels. I open up the, the, the ureter. You can see the blue line demarcating the incision. And then I perform 
and the trusotomy on the bladder. I averted the mucosa and then actually perform an anastomosis lateral, lateral to the uh, bladder and the ureter. And so far the patient stopped having uh, pain and is currently doing well. The downside of this approach is actually that it may generate reflux, but if the patient doesn't get infected, um, we rarely believe that that's gonna be a problem. Um, this other uh, case is actually a technique that we developed in Toronto, uh, where we uh, proposed a different approach for obstructive non-functioning uh, upper moieties. Uh, we actually drain the collecting system laparoscopically and clip it. So we empty the kidney, then uh, thoroughly irrigate it with antibiotics and clip each end, and we're done with the case. Uh, the benefit of this is that it's almost an ambulatory procedure with very low morbidity. If there are issues afterwards, uh, there have been some uh, uh, situations where we've seen uh, persistent infections or sometimes uh, pain. Um, we actually have uh, the ability to then perform a nephrectomy um, and, and just uh, avoid any further issues. But uh, I think it's a very interesting approach. We've used it for also non-functioning kidneys on patients that are on dialysis. The undescended testicles, I think um, one of the most important uh, perspective of, of laparoscopic surgery is the ability to do um, procedures that are not uh, as painful, but I think in a way, um, the management of orchiopexy can also put additional issues on, on patients. And one of them is actually the need for uh, two-stage procedures. And the Fuller-Stevens technique has popularized, but I, I believe that we need to rethink the way we do it. Uh, I, it doesn't make sense to me uh, that uh, clipping the ureters uh, is of any benefit because we're just compromising the vasculature. And I ran into this paper from Dr. Shihada from uh, Egypt, where he actually performs anchoring of the testicle on the contralateral side inside the abdomen. And that tension actually facilitates uh, the length and increases the length of the cord uh, to, on the second stage, bring it further down. And I actually have tried this uh, with uh, probably nine patients already. And the good thing is that I was able to mobilize the testicle. You can see on the left how dissociated it is, but I anchor it to the, where, where the port was placed on the contralateral side. I used non-absorbable suture. Um, and then uh, four months later, I came back and you can see how, how long the cord turned. And so that allowed the second stage to be uh, performed without injuring the cord vessels. And if I do have some difficulty, I can clamp the vessels and then come back and perform a Fuller-Stevens, but that's not ideal. Uh, the downside of this approach, and that's why I haven't been doing it for every single patient, is because I found this when I entered. It was actually an internal hernia, and the sigmoid was actually riding over the testicle, so almost like a hammock. And so that made me think um, about this procedure. And uh, I, I've been thinking about how uh, of ways of improving this, but uh, it makes total sense to me to preserve the vasculature. Also, um, it, it's possible, and we have not explored this uh, in depth, but um, intravesical surgery without going into the peritoneum uh, makes sense in a way that uh, we are not going to be creating any possible scars and uh, adhesions on the bowel. So if we can and have a case where we can do it intravesically, uh, that is also uh, a good option. And this is a case of a nine-year-old with uh, urinary tract infections and hematuria that had a diverticulum. You can see that the opening in the bladder was wide. Uh, and so I decided to place the ports into the bladder and then fill up the bladder. You can see on the image on the upper right hand that uh, uh, next to the, ins the laparoscopic instrument is the cystoscope. And I introduced the cystoscope through the penis to fill up the bladder with gas and then perform just with two trochors the procedure. And so I was able to dissect the, the diverticulum intravesically 
and the patient recovered well. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Uh, please use this uh, barcode to just share your comments and, 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 and hopefully get uh, connected in the future um, to generate further discussions. I'm, I'm grateful to have had this opportunity and I'm happy to uh, get any questions uh, from you now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bernalas. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Who came to the last of the home? I would say, and I thought I had Hi, Sudi. Case was that there. In there, the scope and the curve tower. Ticket no one can cross. Yes, sir. 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 But also, I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that there was not going to be any bleeding. So what I did was that I closed the muscle layer with Vicryl. And that first mm -hmm. layer, uh, since I didn't have much space, the, the benefit of the uh, Vicryl was that it allowed me to just keep the tension without sliding. Um, if I had used PDS or any other suture, then that would have been a little bit more challenging. So I used that. Uh, some people have used the V-lock, which is that braided suture yeah. that has yep. self-retaining um, kind of like uh, teeth. And I think that is very uh, a very good option. But in pediatric urology, I've seen that the size of those sutures is too big. So I didn't have any room to put the needle into the bladder. And so that's why I didn't use the V-lock. And for the mucosa, I just did a simple closure with um, monocryl. Um, and and that, that's how I uh, completed the closure. I know some people use uh, chromic for suturing the bladder, but um, I virtually use Vicryl for, for most of them. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Am I am I right to understand to uh, you just did the cystoscopy and put the uh, laparoscopic trocar into the bladder, right? Correct. So what I did, I'm happy to share the slides again. Um, I think I don't is I placed the cystoscope inside the bladder and filled up the bladder. Yep. And then with ultrasound, I demarcated and you, you were able to see on the skin where the bladder was located. So I overfilled the bladder. And then once the bladder was filled mm -hmm. with ultrasound, I performed a percutaneous uh, puncture of the bladder. And once I was mm -hmm. in, then I placed the trocar into the bladder and continued the irrigation. And so I kept the bladder full. And then once the trocars mm -hmm. were in place, I evacuated the irrigation and started the gas through the cystoscope. The pressure that I used was oh. the, same for, the same that I used for uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery. So no more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> So here you can see the line with the filled bladder in the syringe. Yes. I did puncture initially with a small needle 
to make sure that I was mm -hmm. not going to get into any uh, um, injuries. And then also with the ultrasound, I tried to demarcate the um, epigastric vessels. So you don't actually have much room to work with. Um, and this was a nine-year-old boy. I don't think any uh, younger kids will be easier to, to do. Uh, one of the things that I struggled a lot during the case was this metal uh, trocar. They are very slippery and they tend to come out of the bladder. So if you have mm. self-retaining trocars that are plastic, uh, and have those um, corrugated um, surfaces, I think that allows to retain the trokers inside more easily. Nice. <laughs> Uh, the doctor Hule is asking about the duplex ureter and also I'm functioning at the upper mighty. Is it okay if just clipping uh, the ureters? Is there any uh, further complication? That's a very good question. And I actually get this question a lot. The original description of ureteral clipping is actually from a doctor in Colombia, in South America. And that doctor used to do, at the moment of the kidney transplant, ligation of the ureters. So he would open up the bladder um, and then would close the, the ureters when he was doing the re-implant. And that was done for kids that had been a neuric, so not producing any urine uh, for many years, and they were on dialysis. And he proved that you could ligate those ureters without any complications. We extrapolated that uh, experience to our pediatric population, and we did uh, initially this surgery in about 20 to 50, 20 patients. Um, and we selected patients that had just upper non-functioning moieties, uh, patients that had <clears throat> non-functioning kidneys. Uh, and we found that the kids that had non-functioning upper moieties associated to reflux had a higher chance of developing infections. And I think the reason is if you have reflux from the lower moiety and you clip the upper moiety, then that bacteria can go up into the upper moiety and create infections. So uh, I think selecting the patients is very important. If, um, and, and that's when we started, because uh, we used to just let, uh, isolate the ureter and clip it. But since that case, we started actually opening the ureter and irrigating it with antibiotics and then evacuating everything that we have inside that, uh, that kidney, and we haven't had any issues after that. Um, and for complete yeah. kidneys that have not, uh, have non-function, I think it's important to know how much non-function that is, because we ligated once a kidney that had 10% function and the patient presented with severe hydronephrosis. Um, we just decided to remove the kidney just because it was a very big um, hydronephrosis and we were worried about kidney rupture. But uh, all the other ones where you only have one to 5% function, um, they have all gone, all done well. <laughs> Да, <laughs> Thank you.
хүртэл үүссэн байгаа гэдэг чинь. За за ойлгол хамгийн голын төр үйл ажиллагааг нь үзэх чинь тэр нефростентограммаар л үзэх чтэй юм уу? Тэр үгээр үйл ажиллагааг хэрэгжилчихсэн Okay, everything is clear. Saur asof kano. Atat ni asof ten. Turong mega uriteri hangga harsun tirinder mega uriteri darasun bisno ta open ta ta sabat matuk kagar chun dekles ng atin sas ninget darasun itin tir anti reflux ni bisbehan yamro. About the mega ureter. You just uh, uh, anastomose it uh, from the outside of the vesicle. How is the yes. reflux after the surgery? So um, I actually, um, I'm pretty sure there is reflux. Um, and I tell parents up front that there is a chance that there is reflux. And so uh, here. So, on the image below, that's a, a graph that I did. So this is a drawing that I did about the surgery and that's what I use to show parents. If you have the distal obstruction, the benefit of doing this ureter vesicostomy is that you're not devascularizing the ureter. So you're not compromising the vasculature. You are preserving the other ureter if there is a duplex system and the benefit of this is that you are deobstructing a kidney. And I think reflux by itself is not a problem. The problem is actually the genetic predisposition to get infected. And this applies the same to transplant patients. We know that there is a lot of transplant patients where we do ureteral reimplants and never get infected. The problem is those that have had infections due to reflux. And so I think if you have a patient with reflux that it's getting infected, but also has an obstructive upper moiety, it's somehow very likely that he will get in trouble with that reflux. If it's just a primarily obstructive mega ureter, I think deobstructing the kidney will be better than the reflux itself. And some the majority, when I when I explain them this, they actually elect the this uh, ureter vesicostomy. And the other benefit is if it fails, then we can still come back and do a ureteral reimplant, and and that in that way avoid the reflux. But the concern of doing a formal ureteral reimplantation is that this ureter, as you can see on the images below how dysplastic they are and how it is likely that if you do a formal reimplantation, you will be increasing the resistance on the ureter and then creating more obstruction. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I've seen incredible um, improvement with this technique. I also um, do uh, perform sometimes the ureter. Ure mm -hmm. So, so Fernando's doctor he showed it with the mitage of any mega ureter. After the shiner hot to go to mitage reflux usen usen. So, mum push it just so that go it just an entry reflux. You. Ойлоо тавигдахгүй байдаг. Их их хагалт зарим хагалт байдаг. Их их хагалт байдаг. Тавигдахгүй байдаг. А тэр нь энэ бол ерөөхдөө тийм давтан давтан бүр шийдний замын халдвар үүсгээс үүсгээдээ гэсэн яг тийм батлагцсан юм бол байхгүй байгаа. Ер нь бол бүглэрч байснаас доошоогоо онгорхоо байсан энэ үн болон хүүхдүүдэд эргүүлүү давуу талтай та харагдаж даадгүй давуу талтай байдаг аа. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, currently we don't have any further question. Thank you for the very informative and advanced lectures for us. It's great pleasure to have in you. No, I'm Thank actually you. the one who's thankful. Uh, I really had an incredible um, time and I, I'm hopeful that this is just the beginning of a long-term relationship. Um, I'm actually looking at the chat. Let me see, um, where is the chat? I probably lost it. Um, I just wanna share with you all my email just in case you want to connect, um, but I don't, let me see here, chat, here it is. Okay, you can feel free to email me at any time. Um, I'm happy to connect with you. Okay, I just told them about your. Yeah, I just mail, put it on the chat. Address. Yeah, you got it. Excellent. So I hope to see you soon. Uh, you're all very welcome here in Seattle. Uh, I hope you stay safe and, as well as your families. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Katie. It's a yeah, great yeah. lecture for today. Hope you yeah, will you see you in, in a month, right? In a month, yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. And thank you so much, Dr. Lumitakura for organizing. Yes, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Okay, here we, here we gonna finish our lecture. lecture. See you next time in Mongolia. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is the end. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. thank you. Bye. -bye.